Okay, we're going to get started right on the dot. That's my German heritage shining through. <laughs> Uh, hopefully everyone is here who wanted to come. If not, then hopefully they'll they'll slipstream in and be able to uh, still pick up where we are at the time. I'm not going to, I mean, this is, as I say, a dead simple introduction to application security. Uh, so, so kind of the focus for today is just a nice casual conversation with a gentle introduction to application security, to, to Spring Security and Spring Boot using Spring Security to secure your Spring Boot application. In the possibly the simplest way possible. Um, there are many other alternatives uh, within the Spring Security um, constructs, but I wanted to, uh, again, <laughs> as the title says, I wanted to assume nothing because um, I was chatting with a friend of mine earlier today, and, and there are three things that developers uniformly could be better at doing. Um, and, and I mean, guilty. Uh, so, uh, but but frankly, most developers could be better at debugging, and and that's something that I don't think we stress often enough and and with enough depth. And that's something that I really want to put together a talk on one of these days. I've I've considered it, toyed with it, threatened to do it for so long, and just haven't gotten it done yet. Um, but hopefully soon, hopefully someday. Uh, the others testing. They're just frankly nobody. I don't know of anybody who who wouldn't feel better if they were better at testing. Uh, and the third is securing your applications. And and again, I'm guilty too, because for years I looked at security as, oh my gosh, it's this amorphous blob, you know, you, you poke one side and then, uh, you know, something expands on the other side and and you, you secure one thing and then it opens another hole and uh, it's just, it's too hard. Where do you even start? And, and I a couple of years ago, I started thinking, you know, if there was a way to make this a little more approachable, I think we would all be better off. And as you'll see here today, Spring Security adopts a secure by default, or at least as secure as possible, based on the information provided by default posture, uh, as opposed to a lot of other options that you may be familiar with, or, or and not just in security terms, uh, specific to a security type of package or tool chain, but in terms of anything, because as developers, what do we insist on? Ease of use, ease of getting started. And of course, that actually kind of works against us downstream when it comes time to secure things, because if we make things super open and insecure, but very easy to get up and running with, then invariably what happens is out of every 100 applications deployed to production, I don't know what the numbers are, 2, 5, 22, uh, will go into production with those completely lax, open, non, you know, insecure um, conditions. So with Spring Security, as I'll show throughout, it's it's very much a will adopt the most secure position possible based on the inputs provided, and then you can tweak those. And it's super simple to get rolling. So this is again that dead simple introduction. I I want to turn this into a series, so I want to kind of explore one aspect today, and then. Uh, you know, maybe in a few weeks, we'll take apart another aspect. But uh, yeah, thanks for joining me. So again, my name is Mark Heckler. I'm a Spring develop developer and advocate uh, with VMware. So um, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, uh, by all means, do reach out to me. There are a couple email addresses listed here, personal and, and professional. Uh, but the best way to reach me is on Twitter. If you follow me on Twitter, you know that. Uh, because I live there, right? And if you don't follow me on Twitter, why? Why do you not follow me on Twitter? So check it out, uh, ping me there. And um, if you do follow me and immediately have a question you don't want to post to the world, uh, you can even if you've followed me 10 seconds before, you can send me a direct message. I, my DMs are open. So ping me. Uh, happy to carry on the conversation at length. Uh, and, and again, this is, you know, security is a broad ranging topic. This is just a small uh, wedge of it. And we'll, yeah, happy to to expand, explore and go from there. So uh, a little bit about myself. I have um, actually uh, co-authored a couple of books. I've just con con completed a book solo, which I'll mention. I'll give you a bit more information on here momentarily. But uh, stepping aside from that for a moment, uh, I am an architect and developer by trade. I'm a Java champion, Java 1 rockstar, Google developer expert in Kotlin, so on and so forth. Um, all great awards that, um, you know, still sitting here at home in my home office and during this uh, lovely time that we're dealing with, I still have to buy my own coffee, so eh, go figure. But it's good coffee, so 
you know, no complaints there. Uh, I am also the sole creator and curator of Spring Noticias en Español. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, I realized that uh, there was no central place for gathering and sharing Spanish language resources with Spring and Java and Kotlin and Gradle and and uh, Groovy and and Maven and uh, you know all these good things that uh, you know depending on who you ask. Uh, Spanish is either the second or fourth most spo most spoken language in the world. So I thought, well, you know, that's something I could help with. I'm I'm okay with Spanish. I'm worse with Spanish than I am with English, which is admittedly is pretty terrible. But thanks for tuning in today anyway. Uh, but yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I, I try to uh, gather and disseminate resources in Spanish. So si eres hispano hablante, déjame extender tu voz. If you're not a Spanish speaker, that's fine. That's it's all good. I'm also a licensed pilot. That's something that I'm I'm uh, pretty excited about still. Uh, that was a longtime goal of mine, and I finally did get through all of the training, all of the tests, the written, the oral, the check write, and all that stuff. Uh, and uh, several months back, went ahead and got my pilot's license, and it's kind of awesome, right? Uh, which now nobody's flying, so you know at least I can go fly myself from time to time. So. It's, it's kind of cool. All right. Everybody needs a hobby, right? All right. So yeah, new book. It is now available. It's available uh, via Kindle, uh, ebook format. Uh, the, the actual files have gone to the publisher and the physical printed books will be available probably within a week or two weeks, I'm told. Uh, but yeah, it's out. So if you're interested in knowing more about Spring Boot, uh, with Java and Kotlin, by all means, check it out. If you follow this link, it takes you directly to the O'Reilly site, but of course, Amazon and any other major booksellers should be accessible as well. Again, check it out if you're interested. <clears throat> so today, oh, time to take a drink of coffee, I think. And I'm sorry, I these types of, of kind of casual conversations, I try to slow myself down because I get excited and I I usually have way too much material to cover. I've scoped this down to a fairly small bite uh, today, and I should be able to relax and enjoy and just have a nice slow conversation. But I get excited about this stuff, so I tend to ramp up. So bear with me. I will try to slow my pace down. Uh, this is more of a Bob Rossian type of approach, you know, happy trees, right? We're going to talk about the good stuff here, and, and it is exciting, but it should also be just a nice, pleasant conversation even though I can't see anyone here, which makes me a little sad, but I hope you're there and I hope you're again, enjoying that good hot beverage. So um, key points. So I wanna talk a bit about authentication and authorization, how Spring Security has you covered, how different options that are available and they're at your disposal via Spring Security to secure your applications. Uh, specifically today, I'm gonna to be talking about forms-based security and we're gonna talk about and show and code uh, different uh, different ways of implementing that with uh, Spring MVC or an imperative. That's um, really a bit of a misnomer, but a blocking API um, and, a, and blocking constructs and mechanisms to secure that or reactive streams based non blocking APIs. So let's let's double back uh, just a bit and I'll go into more of, uh, on all of these things as we go through the code, but uh, just to to cover you know, the high points here. So uh, authentication, that's, as I like to say, who's who in the zoo. Authentication is proving you are who you say you are. So if you ever go in to buy alcohol, or if you need to gain access to a building, like uh, your your workplace, should we ever return to a building <laughs> that we, uh, a company where we have authorization or, or have uh, access to a building, we have to authenticate, right? We have to show, typically it's a picture ID. So I'll show my driver's license to, to buy alcohol or I'll show my employee ID badge and uh, to, to tell the person at the front desk, yes, I am who I say I am. And that's exactly what authentication is. It's you're, you're saying, this is who I am. They typically will compare, right? You compare your photo ID with you and say, yep, that's him or that's her or whatever. They, they just look at you and say, they make a determination, right? So they say, yep, you are who you say you are. So that's authentication. Now, that gets to the next point, right? Are you authorized? So if I'm under 
21 here in the US. If I'm under 21 and I'm trying to buy a beer and I show a driver's license and my driver's license says that I'm 19 and a half, that's been a couple of years, um, <laughs> then I'm not going to be authorized to purchase that beer. If I walk in or try to walk into a, a building, a VMware building, and yes, I am who I say I am, my employee ID shows that, but if I don't have, if I shouldn't have access to that building, I am not authorized to enter that building. I don't have authorization to those resources provided by that building. So that's the difference, authentication and authorization. Now I will tell you this, as you have already seen, they start with auth, right? So they, and they sound enough alike that occasionally your brain twists around and mine too, I say the wrong thing. So when I catch myself saying that, I back up. So if I do misstate something today, I will try to catch that and say, oops, I meant the other. <laughs> That just always is fun. I really wish they would have found a couple of different terms that were like A to Z or something like that, but here we are. So authentication, you are who you say you are. Authorization, you have access to specific resources. And that's the distinction. They work together. You have to validate you are who you say you are, and then it can be determined if you should have access to something or things. Spring Security bakes in both, right? Authentication and authorization. It also works with various different providers, external providers, should you choose to go that route via Spring Security uh, with things like OpenID Connect and OAuth2. And that's just top, the topic of a different uh, session, a different, uh, different conversation that we'll have hopefully in the future. But today, <clears throat> just know that regardless of what mechanism within Spring Security you use, you have that capability to address both authentication and authorization. We're going to be dealing with forms-based security today um, and, and a few other things, kind of ancillary things around that, but we're not specifically not going to be dealing with external providers. We're going to be keeping it all internally here. Uh, and, and again, very simplified, simple, the, the straightest path today. Okay, so... Uh, Pilot reference here, flight level 180. So from 18,000 feet, uh, you know, and that's that's where it goes class alpha airspace. So that's the high stuff, right? That's where your jets and stuff fly, or at least your, your bigger iron. So um, spring security from that high level view. Uh, there are a lot of different facilities, a lot of different capabilities provided by spring security, but I kind of like to focus in on these three things because I feel like, uh, you know, they, they hit the high points well. Uh, to not to exclude anything else, but these are, I think, the, the critical pieces to, to discuss today. Uh, so the HTTP firewall, many, many, many compromises to applications and systems happen because of bad inputs, right? So you have malformed URIs for one, for as an example, uh, which allow numerous or probably innumerable exploits to various different systems in the past, present, and will in the future. Uh, the HTTP firewall is kind of that first line of defense. And I, I'm going to kind of be hitting on these fairly quickly and at a high level again, <laughs> flight level 180, but uh, happy to discuss these, you know, again, with more detail down the road. But suffice it to say, the HTTP firewall checks for malformed URIs, checks for bad uh, inputs coming in. And then if it, if it, finds a bad input, it cuts it off there. So the request is just terminated without trying to process, trying to manipulate it and make it fit uh, and, and possibly opening up a hole in your, your application or your system of applications. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, security filter chain. Now each application can have actually technically multiple security filter chains, but, but typically it just does have one. An application has one. Uh, and a security filter chain is how you filter the requests that come in. Assuming you don't have a malformed uh, request coming in, once that request comes in, then it's processed through the list of filters. So if you have uh, for this set of URIs that it should do this, and for this set of URIs it should do that, and for this, this set of conditions it should do that. If it goes through all of those and doesn't match a, any of them, it, the request, once again, is discarded. So you don't have that case of trying to make a square peg fit in a round hole, perhaps misinterpreting, perhaps opening up a, a hole that no one could have foreseen. Um, so the filter chain actually does protect you in, in that it allows, it's, it's an allow list, right? So it, it covers what circumstances, what, uh, what destinations are, are allowed. 
If the request doesn't fit those, it's discarded. Now, an important point to make about the filter chain, and, and I'm gonna make this here now, and I'll probably make it again later because it's of, of critical importance, is to list the most specific things first. Because as soon as a, a request comes in and it's evaluated and it matches a particular filter, that's processed and it's a response is built and life goes on. So if you have it very generally, the first filter, let's say of any authorized, or excuse me, any authenticated user, any authorized requests, uh, and, and that matches pretty much anybody who's logged in, right? At that point, that person, that request, I should say, has access to everything. So what you wanna do is go to the most specific stuff and define that first. Does it match this? No. Okay, broaden the loop a little bit. Does it match that? No. Uh, how about this? Oh, yes, it matches this condition. And, and at that point, that's processed and goes on. So it should only get to that kind of like last ditch, you know, okay, you know, your login page is available to anyone, for instance. That should be at the end, not at the beginning. Okay, uh, request headers. Now, this is, uh, this is the way that... Uh, the W3C um, actually defines certain headers and, and the IETF uh, that allow requests and responses to be interpreted a particular way and to add uh, security provisions, among other things, to each request and response. So uh, by default, you can provide, uh, I guess you don't have to provide some of these, of course, but, but you can provide more lax or more stringent restrictions on those headers. And it will kind of, again, that secure by default posture. So um, I actually think I mentioned, I'll probably go into this here later on. Um, but again, just out of fear that I, I will skip over this, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and mention a couple of these things here now. Uh, see, the one, although it's, it's hard to see, you know what, I'm going to save the headers until we actually start doing the requests because I want to be able to zoom in on this and make this a little bit more obvious to you. And, and this is kind of small text here. I, I have to capture it to get all there, but it's, it's a little tiny. So, all right. And of course, again, there's more. So coming back to the request filtering, this is the simplified version of it. But again, as I said, something comes in, a request comes in, it's processed through a filter chain. Uh, it goes through the filters one to N of course, really, you know, open ended, number, you can have multiple security chains, what have you. And once it hits a match, then it's processed. If it doesn't hit a match, it's discarded. Okay, so let's code. Uh, let's get to the, the good stuff, right? All right. Okay. So. Okay, here we go. This is the spring initializer. Now I'm going to start here and I'm just going to create a very simple service and we will well, we'll secure it. You know, we'll we'll see kind of where things go. I'll stop along the way and kind of give the the you know the lay of the land. And I'm going to create a, a again simple service. I'm going to use Maven and Java, of course. You know, Gradle, Kotlin, Groovy. You have options. I'm going to go with the current version of Spring Boot. I'm going to change the group to the hecklers.com because why not? And we'll make this our um, Spring Security uh, Code because this is a code session, right? Tanzu Twitch code some, something 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 okay so yeah okay so this is our spring security code application i'm going to build a jar file using java 11 because that's current lts version but again we support back to java 8 and of course the current version current version of java which is 15 but i like to keep it where most of us live right in that lts version and then let's add, add some dependencies so I want to, uh, I want to also build uh, an application that will support, oops, I hit the wrong button. So Spring Web, which gives us a, the ability to build web-based APIs. No, not generate. There we go. Having to look around my mic to see my keys at times. I'm mostly a touch typist, but once in a while on the, the command keys and all that, I have to look down or else, you know, crazy things happen. Uh, I'm also going to bring in the reactive web dependency, which allows me to uh, build reactive streams based applications using reactive streams publishers uh, and spring web flux slash project reactor. So that's kind of nice. <clears throat> uh, I don't think I'm going to need anything like Lombok to simplify things. I'm going to keep this again, pretty straightforward. And let's see. So security, we want spring security. Um, do we want anything else? Uh, Probably not. 
me see if I have a, because I, I usually will keep like an outline here handy. Let me see if I have that that I can reference and see if that gives me, I just want to make sure I don't leave anything out here. Eh, it's probably fine, right? How bad could it be? Eh, we'll add them in later, so. <laughs> we'll just do that. All right, so we'll drop that here on the desktop. I'll open that up. Oh, come on. I, I love having multiple screens, but of course the Mac always dumps things on your uh, main screen. So that's nice, super helpful. Let's see, go there, open that up. In our favorite IDE, NetBeans. <laughs> Kidding. Okay, uh, <laughs> I actually like NetBeans. I, I'm not, uh, I pick on my friends, but IntelliJ is uh, my daily driver. I, I typically use that because it just works really well with my, my workflow and it also really supports Kotlin well, as you might imagine, since the folks at JetBrains are behind both uh, IntelliJ IDEA and, and Kotlin. So that's kind of nice. All right, so if we go to our POM, uh, of course we see that we got our dependencies here as we expected, uh, so that's fine. And then I'm going to go to my application and let's get started. Now, so the first thing I'm going to do is just uh, create a very simple, dollar sign rest controller and we'll call this our uh, security controller security example controller why not oh that sounds nice okay so I'm going to do a get mapping and I'm just going to uh, do a welcome here so I'm going to return a string we'll call it uh, call the method hello and return hello code uh, Fellow coders. Eh, why not? This is why I didn't go into comedy. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and we also want to be able to pull back things like, uh, eh, you know, um, all. So we'll we'll make this the all endpoint, and everybody should be able to get this, right? So we'll return a string. Uh, let's see. So this is all users, and uh, return. And we'll make this a heading two. Greetings, intrepid, intrepid travelers. All right, and of course we want to close. Oh, come on. There we go. So let me see if I can close that out. H2. And we want an admin page, right? So that way we can show some admin stuff. So admin and string admin only return and we'll make this h1 right so greetings let's see eh, let's make it fun god mode activated oh, we want that h1 nice okay so this is admittedly a very very simple example so let's let's run this Gives me a chance to take a drink too. All right, now let's let's check this out. So I'm going to let's see terminal, and let's expand that just a skosh, and HTTP. I use HTTP instead of curl because oh bump. Sorry about that, because it is curl for humans. Uh, it allows you to shortcut things. It has opinions about things just like Spring does. So rather than type out this long verbose text that you would use for curl, uh, it has certain shortcuts. So for instance, if you don't specify a host name, it assumes localhost, that's kind of nice. Uh, if you don't specify a port, it assumes 80. So I actually want to go to 8080 and we'll just go to that, right? So we've got, yeah, just uh, hello fellow coders is what we should see. But it's telling us we are unauthorized. We're getting a 401 unauthorized. Now, before I get into that, I promised I would, would address some of the headers. So I want to do that now. There are a couple of things here. Cache control, no cache, no store, max age zero, must revalidate. And of course, the pragma, no cache. Now, those are so that you don't have um, 
information cached in your browser. This is very important uh, when you're in a an office type setting or, or a coffee shop or what have you. You might walk away just for a second, right? You you just leave your 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 screen unlocked just for just for a few seconds while you go get that latte. Ooh, that sounds so good. But uh, what can happen is even if you were on a banking site and you change to a different site, if somebody can slide over and maybe click the back button and have those credentials cached, they can still have access to your private critical information. So that's obviously a bad thing. Now, if you specify no cache, no store, max age zero, you invalidate that cache. So therefore, as soon as you navigate back to that page, you must revalidate, you must re-authenticate. So that by default uh, is a more secure posture just provided via the headers that you would you would see via requests and responses. Uh, you also have things like no sniff for the content type options here. Let me highlight that. And what that what that does is specify to any browsers or user agents that they shouldn't try to sniff the content and determine what type that content is and then render it. So for a while there, there was there were browsers and specifically one, which is a terrible citizen, uh, which will remain nameless. Uh, but I think everyone knows which one. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't the only offender. It was just the longest offender, I, I guess. But we would try to, by default, sniff the content and say, oh, that smells like a JPEG. Let me render that in the, in the browser so you don't have to actually, you know, force it to render. You don't have to specify to go ahead and display that. <clears throat> the problem is it's easy to masquerade certain content as other certain content. So you may be thinking you're rendering a JPEG, but it actually has embedded code within. Uh, and you have other examples, you know, uh, PDFs and, and um, postscript files and things like that. So, um, so you don't want your browser or user agent to sniff the content. So we specify again, no sniff by default. Spring Security places that header in there. Uh, you have X frame options for de uh, set to deny, and that's important because this locks down the idea or the 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 possibilities of clickjacking. What is clickjacking? You may be asking. Uh, it, it combines two terms, right? Click and hijacking. So if if you are in a browser window and you have your banking information up and, and you might say, you, you might see at the bottom a button that says log out or, or you know, continue to next page or whatever, and you click on that button, you expect that to act a certain way, to, to perform a certain action. The problem is if you have frames enabled, what might be there is a, an invisible or a transparent frame hovering over a particular button. So when you click that, you're not clicking the button, you're clicking the frame, which then a different action could be taken. And then in turn, at the end of that sequence of actions that might be terrible to your, your financial health or your, your mental well-being, uh, then that can go ahead and process that button click and you'd be none the wiser. So uh, we do want to deny, deny by default any kind of uh, frames. Uh, and of course, cross-site script, script protection, uh, say that three times fast, uh, by default should be blocked uh, because that allows or, or it locks down your, your cross-site scripting attacks. So uh, again, if you're using something like a content delivery network, you may need to tweak that, but by default, again, it adopts that most, most uh, secure posture possible. Now, coming back to the 401 unauthorized, uh, we didn't we didn't authenticate, so we can't be authorized to re to access this this resource. In this case, it's a fairly simple string, right? But we didn't authenticate, and part of Spring Boot's uh, compelling functionality, its power, its its ability to give dev superpower superpowers, is its auto configuration. And just by adding Spring Security to our dependencies here. We have Spring Security in the class path, which is enough for Spring Boot to say, hey, you must want to secure your application. And certain default security is put into place on our behalf just for adding that dependency, which is a huge, huge concept, right? So you don't have to go back and secure it or else everything's open. No, it starts off from a posture of security. Now, how does it do that? We didn't give it any other information. If you scroll back through your log, you can see here that there is a use, a it's using a generated security password and it gives us one. Now this is again, pretty rudimentary, but we didn't give it any information at all. So this is pretty impressive just out of the box. So I'm just going to add a, an auth and the username, which is user by default, it creates a single user named user and a password that's generated each time the application is restarted. And here we go. 
So that's pretty cool. Let me uh, let me zoom in here. So that's pretty cool. We have the ability to secure things kind of out of the box. Again, it's nothing fancy, but with providing no effort on our part, we now have at least a minimally secured application. Now, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and go to another. We'll just exercise our endpoints here. So let's see, this was all, and we get our intrepid travelers, and we'll go to admin. Now, obviously there's formatting here, but, but we see there's probably, you probably already picked up on another concern, a few concerns. First of all, we have one user and one password, which is not the best scenario, right? I mean, typically you want to have auditability in your secure uh, security mechanisms, which means that if I log in and I do something terrible, it should be able to be traced back to me. And if, if you log in and do something terrible, it should be able to be traced back to you. Now, if everyone in our group is using the same user ID and password, we've eliminated auditability other than the fact that maybe 10 or 50 or 500 or however many people can be, it can be narrowed to that, but certainly we can't pin that down. We can't isolate that and identify the problem. So that's a problem. The other thing, of course, is that, you know, each time you restart the application, uh, the password is regenerated. So every time you do this, you'd have to notify everyone, hey, this is a new password, use this. Again, not good. <laughs> so let's, let's add some, some authentication capabilities into this. All right, now, I used to do this another way, but as of Spring Security 5.4.2, which is very recent, uh, we have the ability to define uh, our, our authentication and, and more specifically our authorization the same way, whether we're using a blocking or a non-blocking API. Now, that said, there are some minor differences, which we'll get into uh, momentarily. So I'm going to enable web security and just create a security config class. So security config... And I need to create a couple of beans here. Now, uh, the first bean, we need to be able to authenticate, right? So this is our, we need to provide a user detail service. And I'm going to just make this method authenticate. And we will create the ability to authenticate various users. And then I want to also create a bean to authorize those users for any resources. Now, uh, I'll come back to this momentarily, uh, but let's go ahead and just uh, just define this, or at least start to define this. We want to provide what? A security filter chain, which we've already talked about just a bit. So authorize, and we will be, um, let's see, HTTP security. There we go, and then we'll deal with that. So I'm going to just set this aside for a moment. <laughs> okay. Now to authenticate, what I need to do is define a couple of users. So I'm going to uh, just do a user details uh, and we'll define, eh, I usually use myself as a bad example, but I'm, I feel like we should pick on someone else today. So let's, let's say Bob, he's our user and we're going to provide Bob's user details, right? So user uh, dot builder. So we're going to create a builder here and we're going to uh, set the username to Bob and we'll define the password as Bob, because Bob's not very security conscious. You can you can see this probably isn't going to go well for Bob, right? And we're going to set Bob's role as a user, uh, and that's probably good to get get rolling. Uh, unfortunate though it is, and then we'll add our user details for Alice. I chose these based on you know some security training I took a hundred years ago, and <laughs> Bob and Alice, right? So and we'll take our um, user builder and we'll specify Alice's username as Alice and Alice's password as um, strong password, one, two, three, exclamation point. So that's that's better, right? So Alice is a little more on the ball here than Bob is. Uh, so, you know, whether she likes it or not, we're going to make her an admin. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you entrust, uh, you know, with what it, what is it? Uh, the reward for work well done is more work. So Alice gets to be the admin here. So poor Alice. Uh, she has to look out for Bob trying to, or accidentally corrupting the system. But, uh, you know, everybody's got their problems. So uh, I'm also going to, uh, just because I think it's kind of instructive, I'm going to uh, set this up where we can see what uh, the passwords are here. So Bob's password, and we'll just say password. And then we'll duplicate this and we'll check this out for Alice, get her password showing. And then I'm just going to format this to make this nice and clean. Uh, and, and I don't 
by the way, I don't recommend logging passwords. Please, please, please do not do that. <clears throat> but uh, for the purposes of our little chat today, that we're going to do that here. So uh, let's see. Don't do this in prod. Actually, log passwords in prod. Okay, so just wanted to make that very clear. <laughs> okay, and then I'm going to return a new in memory user details manager. And I'm just creating an in memory user details manager, but uh, I also have some code out there on GitHub where you can use JPA, you can also use JDBC, you can use all kinds of different things to, to provide. And of course, you can tie in with LDAP providers and whatnot to provide the store, if you will, for your, your user details. So uh, today we're, we're going to keep it simple. So we're going to uh, put Bob and Alice's information in there and we're going to just create that. So we have the authentication in place. Let's go ahead and run that. Now, by providing a couple of users, what we've done is we've told Spring Security, we don't need that default user and that default password to be generated. In fact, we don't want that. We have uh, a user details, uh, user details manager, excuse me, can't even, can't even talk now, uh, that we're providing and we're providing credentials to be used within that. Okay, so let's go back and we'll go to our favorite user agent, the command line. Um, let's see, so we'll just go here. So let me get rid of the user and we'll check out what Bob has here. Bob and Bob. Oh, let's see. So so why is that coming back? You'd think, you know, we, we, we've got the right password, right? We've got the username right, Bob, and the password, Bob. So you'd think that would be coming back just fine, but it's not. It's doing a 401, right? So that's unauthorized. Um, what could the problem be? So let's let's go back and look here. And we see right here, and this is this is good. There's no password encoder mapped for the ID null. So it's not even showing us an ID, right? But it's telling us, it's giving us a pretty good hint. There's no password encoder mapped. Now, this is the reason I logged this because I wanted to, to be able to show this. This makes very clear, I think, what the problem is. <laughs> Uh, because we see here that Bob's password is Bob, right? And Alice's password is this strong password string here. Now, this looks suspiciously like clear text. And that's because this is clear text. And this is a bad, bad thing, all right? You certainly don't want to log any kind of passwords, but you really don't want to log them as clear text. And you don't want to store them even as clear text. So how are we going to deal with that? Well, the, the hint is right here. We don't have a password encoder defined. Let's define our password encoder. So I'm going to create a, uh, a variable here. So let's see, this will be our password encoder. And we'll call this PW encoder equals uh, password encoder factories, create delegating password encoder. Now, we can actually define a particular and choose a particular password encoder. But I'd like to show this if we go in and take a look at this. Uh, we see that we've got our delegating, we're creating a delegating password encoder and the default is bcrypt, which is a pretty good default, right? But we still support like no op, which is actually no encoding whatsoever. Bad, bad, bad. But you know, it's, it's there for demos and what have you. I just don't like using it even for demos because it establishes bad habits. We support some older mechanisms because, you know, again, folks are still using some of these older mechanisms. Sad though it may be, there are certain um, you know, things that are in place that take time to migrate from. Then you have things like PBKDF2, I should say, uh, Scrypt. You have all kinds of different options that are here now that are, you know, fa have fallen out of favor, are currently well regarded. And, and then, of course, you have things that we don't even know what will be coming down the road yet. But we have a mechanism in place where they can simply be added. And by having a user just re-log in, if that the, you know, the, the preference changes if we choose a different option versus in this case, Bcrypt, uh, that, they, that user can be automatically upgraded just by logging in, which is a very powerful concept by itself. So that's kind of nice. Uh, and it's just kind of baked in by default, no extra charge. So I'm going to take this encoder and I will encode the password string here. And I'm going to do the same thing here for Alice. So password encoder dot encode and oops, typo. And let's rerun that. And we should see a slightly different result this time. Now, before I go back and try to log in again, I do want to show this because this is a 
great example of, yes, we actually now do have encoded and encrypted in this case, passwords. Now, some people will look at this and say, wow, you're actually giving away the, the hint that this is bcrypt encrypted, right? This is a problem. I mean, how, how is this secure? Because you're, you're actually telling anyone who may be an attacker, uh, somebody who is a, a, in a threatening position, that this is encoded via bcrypt. This is bad. You're, you're leaking information you don't need. Well, actually, in most methods of encryption, there, there's a tell, right? So, so here you see this $2A$10. So this is a tell that this is bcrypt encoded. This is just adding the bcrypt at the beginning is just convenience for Spring Security. So it really isn't giving any additional information away at all. So if, if somebody does raise that question or concern to you, it's not really a concern. But let's go ahead and try to log in. And let's try to authorize as Bob. And here we go. Everything is working properly because now we're encoding that password and we're testing that against an encoded password. And of course, at that point, it matches. So let's go and check all because Bob is a user. He should have access to all and that works. And actually, I need to go to a browser. So this is a little prettier than just here, but go to admin. And of course, hmm, that works too. And why is that? Well, because we're authenticating, we're making sure that that, you know, somebody's logging in with a proper uh, password. So we're, we're saying, yes, Bob is who Bob says Bob is, but we're not checking any kind of authorization restrictions, right? And let's do that so we can get that done now. All right. Ah, to authorize, we need to create that security filter chain I mentioned. So we're going to use this. We're going to create the HTTP uh, and we're going to uh, authorize requests and we're going to use MVC matchers. And we're going to point to, again, most restrictive first. And uh, that would be admin in this case, right? So admin, and we're going to just do a star star. So anything admin on down will, will be covered, right? And we're going to make sure that, that anyone accessing that has the role of admin, anyone accessing those resources. So I'm going to also check uh, for all slash star star has role and we want them to have the role of user. And then of course, just to be really, uh, really friendly, uh, we want, we have one more uh, here. So hello fellow coders. Uh, let's just say anyone who's actually logged in, doesn't even have to have either of these permissions, which of course we don't have anyone, but just to be very welcoming, we're gonna make sure that um, uh, any other request, if they're authenticated, if the person is author or authenticated, excuse me, uh, that we will allow them to access that. So I also, because until we override that, there are a couple of things that are provided for you out of the gate. And actually, maybe I should show that first. Let's let's do that. So let me just step back a moment. How much time do I have? I don't want to go too long. Oh, we're good. We're, we're we have time. Okay, so let's go here and I'm going to go here. We'll go localhost 8080. Now, this is a this is a login page, right? So so this is a login form. Uh, if you again that Spring Security comes to your rescue because I didn't specify any login form and I didn't specify any logout form. But the fact that you have Spring Security in your class path, Spring Security will provide that capability for you without any further effort on your part. Now, if you want to specify your own, you certainly can, but it's there. It, you don't have to in order to have that capability. So a Bob and Bob, we sign in and there we go. So that works. Now, if I go up and hit log out, of course I can do all and uh, admin, and of course that all works. Uh, and then we can log out. And once again, the log out form is provided for us as well. So, uh, let's go ahead and, and now specify our filter chain. Now I have where we're checking the filter chain, right? So first check admin, check all, then anything else, as long as it's authenticated, it's good. And then we want to do a form login. So we want to provide the capability. If we don't add this in, if this line goes away, right, then form login is not enabled because we're, we're overriding any of that capability that Spring Security will provide out of the box for us if we don't specify. But we're specifying now, right? So we'll add form login. And I want to also add HTTP basic. Uh, and what that does is allow us to use user agents other than browsers, right? So we can't pop up a form here per se, but we want to be able to support that. So we're going to add that HTTP basic. Uh, and then we're going to, let's see, is there anything else? I think that's it. That should be it. Um, 
No, we still do need to build that, right? And yeah, there we go. I was gonna say it seems seemed like I was missing something, and I was. So here I'm, I've got something here. Uh, oh yes, yeah, I should add that. Okay, so that seems happier. So there we go. Let's go ahead and run that and see what we get now. Because until now, if you were authenticated at all, well, it's kind of important to uh, return that. Get excited and get ahead of myself. So until now, what we've had is is we've validated that people are who they say they are. We've authenticated them, but we haven't uh, provided any restrictions to their authorization. So everyone had access to everything. Assuming they could authenticate in the first place. Okay, so let's go back here. Localhost 8080. Bob, Bob, Bob's in. Okay, so let's check all. Bob should have access to all. Now let's let's see if Bob can gain access to the admin page. Oh, no, Bob can't. And that's exactly what should happen, right? Uh, now, what you don't want to do when you're securing your application is provide too much information. So we're not saying, hey, you know, if somebody tries to navigate directly in, log out. And this is a little bad example but let's see we'll go up here um there we go and let's try to go directly to the admin page so we're it's prompting us to log in bob bob now it's not telling us that we have a bad password it's not telling us we have a bad username it's not telling us that we have a bad um uh you know that we have a bad url it's just telling us look this is forbidden uh, you you can't go here. So this is you know it's it's very restricted information, but it's just telling you, hey, this is not allowed. This is not good. Get away from here. So that's that's fine. That's exactly what we wanted to happen. So let's take Alice in this case, and we'll do a strong. Uh, let's see, dollar password. See if I can remember what I put. One two three exclamation. Oh, oh, apparently I didn't remember what I put or typoed it. Alice. Huh, okay, so it's time to go back and look at my, uh, uh, well, I could have sworn that's what I typed. I guess I think I need to, uh, I need to try this again. Oh, I need to log out first. Okay, so let's go back. Let's just start here. Yep, all right, so Alice. Huh, okay, well, typos will get you every time. All right, and all, and admin. Look at that, okay, so we're all in, everything's good, and that's 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 pretty cool, right? And it's simple, there there really is, it's it's such a low, uh, low burden to the developers to do. It's kind of nice, all right. So, um, that's our, our Spring MVC-based approach to, to securing the application and providing uh, authentication and authorization with forms-based uh, authentication, forms-based security. Now, if we want to use Webflux, so if we had, um, uh, let's see, if we had returning, uh, let's say, yeah, let's, let's, yeah, let's just see how far we can take this. Why not, right? So I'm just going to, uh, no, I don't want to comment out Webflux. I want to comment out Web, Star Web. This, this is going to go poorly. I can tell already. I'm just... Uh, commenting out the wrong things. That's that's gonna make things a little more challenging. So mono of string, and this is of course a reactive streams publisher. I'm just returning a mono string, so mono dot uh, just. Yeah, that should work. All right, so mono string once again, and return mono just. And and I, I have other talks where I actually go into uh, the advantages of reactive programming, uh, reactive streams, the things that they give you, the interactions, the the scalability that it enables. Uh, that's certainly out of scope for today, but um, let's just suffice it to say that um, this is very versatile, right? So Spring Security, uh, it, it will work with blocking and non-blocking APIs. So I'm going to just replace my Enable Web Security with Enable Web Flux Security. And then that changes a couple things we do. We need to, instead of providing user detail service, uh, map reactive user detail service. And then let's see, we've got a new map reactive user detail service. So again, it's pretty straightforward replacement here. 
And then instead of the security filter chain, we've got our security web filter chain and server HTTP security. And then we've got a few things here that are just a little bit different. Authorize exchange and then our path matchers path matchers and then actually it might just be simpler to do this any exchange well maybe not actually I'll just do that authenticated yeah look at that okay so let's go ahead and run that assuming I haven't blithely skipped over anything and of course we see once again our passwords don't log those in real life. I probably should just go ahead and uh, <laughs> close that out anyway, just to make that a little more clear. And I'll go ahead and localhost 8080. Eh, it's not up yet. There it is. Okay, so we'll log in as Bob. Come on, Bob. There we go. Hello, fellow coders. All right, all. And admin, Bob, you you CAD, you shouldn't be in here. Access denied. That's even that's even more restrictive, right? As far as the information it provides. So that's that's even better. So let's do that. Alice and strong dollar password. Now everyone will know my password to everything, right? Okay. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, okay, all and admin, and there we go. And then we'll just log out. All right, now my goal was to get done in under an hour. We we did make it. Life is pretty good there. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to cover before I, I sign off for the day. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just so straightforward, right? So I let's see, I covered, just as kind of a quick summary, what we discussed uh, were the ways that you could secure applications just generally using uh, your Spring Boot applications using Spring Security. So... Uh, you have uh, forms-based security. You have um, uh, OpenID Connect and OAuth 2, which again will be in a future episode. <laughs> Join us then. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, and then we launched into uh, using Spring Security, just kind of the, the features it gives you out of the box uh, in terms of that secure by default posture, or as secure by default as possible, based on you know hopefully increasing amounts of information you're providing. But even with no information you're providing just spring security in the class path it, i we discussed and we showed you know, what is there what secures your application on your behalf with no additional inputs from you so things like the uh, the securing it with a user account and a password an automatically generated uh, fairly significant length password um, and certain headers that were added by default to your requests and responses requests and or responses, depending on context, uh, your your security filter chains, how those factor in, and the HTTP firewall. And then we actually built out uh, a means to authenticate different users and to authorize those users to access certain resources using Spring MVC or a blocking API. And then we then retooled that very quickly to use a non-blocking Reactive Streams publisher-based API, a la Spring WebFlux or Project Reactor or and project director should say. So that's kind of the quick tour on how to very painlessly secure your application. Now, I, I did mention that I was going to maybe kind of uh, discuss briefly where you would use this versus where you might not. Uh, this works very well for departmental level type of applications, or even sometimes externally based web based applications. I mean, I have a you know ton of logins to different accounts for diff with different um, you know, providers or vendors or or sites that I visit. Uh, and, and of course, they store that information and they manage their own users and user IDs and passwords. And that's fine, user information, what have you. There are reasons that they might want to do that. Uh, but then if you don't want to put yourself in that game, if you want to use external providers, you have things like OpenID Connect and OAuth 2, which allow you to use providers that have mechanisms standardized mechanisms like that in place. So thing, you know, companies like Okta or Google or Facebook or GitHub and whatnot. So uh, you do have options. Uh, this is a really nice way to secure an application uh, with limited scope or even, again, certain cases with 
either unlimited scope, but certainly if you're talking about an internal application, uh, work group, or even larger application that you want to be able to do that, it's it's a very simple way to at least provide a, a fairly significant level of security with a very minimal level of effort on your part. So with that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, again, please do reach out to me. Uh, let me go back to the slides if I can find them. And yeah, so that's uh, that's the way to do it right there. So ping me, email uh, mheckler at vmware.com, marktheheckler.com, or mkheck on Twitter. And uh, yeah, happy to keep the conversation going. Have a great day and uh, have a secure day. And that is that.